and we're going to hear from Keelan Rice, who is a project manager at Internet X, and Marco Reves, who is a business automation analyst at Internet X. They're going to be talking about take you on a thrilling trip, now that goes well with a car, on uh, Kubernetes and will tell you how they managed to migrate a monolithic application to a service, a microservice based cloud native application hosted on Kubernetes. So please join me and a big CloudFest welcome to both Killian and Marco. Second. Perfect. Thank you so much. Wow. That's nice. So first of all, from our perf uh, personal statistics, um, who knows Kubernetes? Wow. Who doesn't know Kubernetes? And now the guys who would never raise their hands no matter what I'm asking. Oh, one, two. OK, perfect. So welcome to our keynote, Hitting the Cloud with Kubernetes. Um, oh, here's the, the switch. Um, my name is Marco Rives. I am the team leader cloud and automation at InternetX. And um, yeah, I'm happy to be here, like, I think the third or the fourth time right now. And for the first time, I bring my lovely colleague, Mr. Rees, um, to the stage. And uh, he's like one yeah, professional uh, Kubernetes contributor and knows about, uh, a lot about the things. Yeah. So last year, uh, we announced a cool new product, the coolest product for us on the SSL market, Proceed. Uh, Proceed is basically a SSL offloading service where you can encrypt sites um, with uh, SSL, but not only one site at one time, but 10 or 100 or thousands at the same time. It's a full automated process. It offers like um, uh, powerful uh, performance tools for our um, service. Um, it also has uh, optimization tools and caching tools in it. It comes with a worldwide CDN and it has like dozens of other features. So now you're asking yourself, uh, I'm, I'm waiting here for Kubernetes and they're talking about the product. No, it's just, uh, I want to introduce it because when we uh, uh, created this product, um, we had so many features and feature requests from our product managers and we were thinking about yeah, what technology do we use that um, matches all these uh, features. So we had two choices. First, we go for a legacy um, technology or we bring something completely new into the game. And here, then my colleague uh, uh, Kilian came, uh, uh, came into this game and he um, brought Kubernetes on the table. And uh, to be honest, I haven't, hadn't heard of this before. So it was like two, three years ago. It was very new in the market. So it was uh, new for us, but he explained everything. And it was like, OK, um, we should give it a shot. And we said, OK, we, we will the proof of concept. We were super happy with uh, what it uh, does to the product, product. And so our secure network runs on Kubernetes. So we launched it last year. It still runs on Kubernetes. We're still happy with this. So um, we decided we use Kubernetes for our large customers. And uh, so we created the run KS, and uh, we're now running a lot of customers on Kubernetes. We cr created like a shared cluster for, for customers, playground customers, and, uh, and we also created uh, dedicated clouds. But first of all, I guess Kilan will tell you something about Kubernetes. What's, uh, what is actually Kubernetes? And yeah, give us a, some key facts. Yeah. Thanks, Marco, for the lovely introduction. I'm really happy to be here at CloudFest for the first time speaking about Kubernetes. Though many of you have seen our shirts, I think. The what is it? K8S. It's a short term for Kubernetes. It's just K. Eight letters and the S. Kubernetes. Okay. Crazy. Yeah. <laughs> uh, Kubernetes is a container orchestration. It is developed by Google. 
And Google has a lot of experience in running containers because they were running containers in their data center before Kubernetes. They had an internal tool called Borg, and that was their container orchestration, their container runtime. And all that experience, which they collected over the years, flew into Kubernetes. Then, back in 2014, they open sourced Kubernetes on GitHub, and since then, it had a wide range of contributors. I think it was more than 1,600 people daily actively committing on the project. So it's really a, fa a fast growing community, a big community, and the project is really alive. Kubernetes is also the new standard in running containers, in orchestrating containers. Why is it the new standard? Just because all major cloud providers are supporting Kubernetes, named Google, AWS, Asia, and Internet X. Oh, perfect. Oh, yeah. But, Marco, what's so special about Kubernetes? OK, <laughs> thank you so much. Um, uh, like, let us watch on, on three perspectives uh, in Kubernetes. The first of all, not for the techies, but for the business guys who uh, are our SWOT enthusiasts. So uh, in the end, uh, Kubernetes should reduce all costs. Um, you have like a small investment because it's all open source. You don't have like a licensing uh, uh, costs. You can start developing locally, so you don't have like to to, to go into or invest in, in in hardware. You can grow flexible because all major, as Skill and Z, all major cloud providers um, uh, providing it right now on their platform. Um, you have all in all lower risk, and um, in the end, when you implement it right, you will have a dramatically shorter time to market. So it's good for the uh, product managers and for the business owners because you will uh, dramatically increase like your features and products coming out in uh, production. Oh, first, second, first. Oh, sorry. Yeah, like ever. Um, the second perspective is uh, the dev perspective. From a dev perspective, it's like perfect because you can integrate it seamless into your DevOps workflow. You get like more independent from your ops, which is like nice for every uh, developer because you don't have to ask so much for something. And um, it's um, super integrated into all major CI pipelines like uh, GitLab CI. The third perspective is a sysadmin perspective, but I guess you will say something about this. That's my part, because I'm more the techie guy, as you just said, and I'm from the sysadmin sector. So as a sysadmin, what's a container orchestration? What does it for you? I think you have an ocean of containers, and you don't want to know where your containers are running as long as they are running. Just deploy it, data center in Europe, data center in America, in the US, in, in UK. Just you want your application, your containers to run. That's what Kubernetes does for you. Kubernetes oversees all your containers, it watches it, and it reacts to new situations. For example, if you have like a, a promotion or something running on your application and you have high loads of traffic, Kubernetes remembers it, Kubernetes sees it, it scales the right part of, the, of your application, it scales it up, and it reacts to the new situation. That's what the committee's master does for you. Plus, network and infrastructure. Just don't forget about that. That's the biggest point for me. Yeah. Because I'm totally not into network, so it's uh, perfect for me. The network is completely matched by Kubernetes. You don't have to remember any IP addresses. Forget about your VLANs. Kubernetes is fully managed networking also. But how is the situation in real life? We just had, uh, in one of our latest projects, we made a case study, and we started how is the situation today. Many of you may know it from your own applications. Mostly it's a single-tiered application in a monolithic architecture. What does it mean? First, it means you have long release cycles because you have no continuous integration, you have no continuous delivery, you have no DevOps life cycle. So you have lots of manual tasks, no automatization, really bad. Second, you have no modularity. What does it mean? Your application is really hard to understand because it is such a big application and you have really, really, or you must try hard 
to understand the whole application stack, not just a single part. You always have to, to watch the complete application. Then you have no chance to take advantage, advantage of emerging new technologies because you have a long-term commitment to your framework, to your software, to your, I don't know, to your technology stack, which you choose at the beginning of your project. So if you just want to change your PHP version, just update it to 7.1 or 7.2, it's really hard because you have always, you must always see the whole architecture. It takes a long time. Then you have massive dependencies, not only in the, in the application, although in the teams which are developing your application. Because the teams have talked to each other, they must organize themselves, they must, hey, can we do this, can we do that, and there's a really, really big overhead. Then it's complicated to scale, complicated scalability, I just talked about it. You can only scale in one direction. If you have many services, you can just scale the service which needs it, but it's a really big stack, a monolithic architecture, you can just scale the whole stack, just scale in one direction. And maybe, I hope it's not so, but it can be that you have separated devs and ops, which just means they are working not together, they are working against each other, each other and that's a really bad situation. But they were just a few of the many disadvantages of the monolithic stack. So how did we in our last project manage that? How did we proceed all the disadvantages? I guess it took three steps to uh, get to the top uh, in, in our situation, what we found. First of all, we created like a massive service map just to get to know the whole application. And uh, some of you may know it, if you have like a monolithic uh, uh, application, it's like getting very big to understand it. So first of all, service map. Then we had to look at the organization. How is the team working with each other? We had to look at the processes and the workflows. Are, is there a, a, a DevOps workflow already implemented in the, in, in, in the enterprise? Or do we have to change something there? And the current challenges. Why should they change? I, I guess you, you mentioned some of them. Uh, the next step was uh, we created a DOD, a definition of done, just, just to, to say uh, what do we want to have in the end. Um, like. What technology do we want to have? What workflows and goals? I mentioned like uh, DevOps workflows, continuous integration, continuous delivery. And um, uh, in this case, why uh, yeah, did we choose uh, KDS and not OpenStack? Yeah, I think it was mainly of two reasons. The first one was we wanted to be independent from the hardware stack. So if you're running KVM or OpenStack, you are always dependent on the hardware. If you just choose um, maybe Google, Google is running KVM, AWS is running Xen virtualization, so every major cloud provider has a different setup. And you have, if you are running on Google, you have to deploy your stack like Google will, um, will need it, and if you're running on AWS, you have to do it different. Second one is, um, if you're running containers, you're completely independent because just put your whole application in the container, put all your file systems in it, put all your configuration files in it, and it's really, really transportable. You can deploy the same application on your cloud and on your laptop if you're trying to, to, to bring out new features or just fix some bugs. You have always the same application because you're running the same container on your local hardware as you're running it on the cloud. So you're really, really flexible. You have much flexibility, and you're really independent. The third point was a proof of concept. Uh, uh, it's not about only like uh, proving that the, the, the software is working right now. I think the, the main reasons why we, we created the proof of concept was uh, cred getting credibility in the, in the team and uh, uh, putting the team together like that all, is, uh, all guys are running in the same direction. But it wasn't that easy, uh, mm -hmm. <laughs> always, yeah. So, as I mentioned, like convincing the team was one of the hardest challenges and convincing the management because it's like 
Some, sometimes it's a hard trail just to go to the DevOps uh, lifecycle and uh, implement uh, Kubernetes into your lifecycle. So that's not so easy as it sounds right now. So it was uh, a big challenge convincing the management just because they're not getting their features, they're not getting products so fast, so they have some months where uh, everything is a little bit slower. So the third point was uh, know-how transfer in, in the company because uh, you have like ops, you have devs, you have to bring them together to, to build the classic app, uh, DevOps. And the uh, third point was yeah. technology, technology transformation. So as hard as you may try, you can't always transform 100% of your monolithic application to cloud services or to cloud microservices. There will always be like 10% of legacy code which you just can't put in a container and run it on the cloud. So you have to think about it. What part of my application can I transform into cloud native services? And the last point, the last challenge was defining bleeding edge best practices because Kubernetes is a really young project. It's just starting in Germany and Europe. And you will always, in your project, will always hit a point or a problem which no one has ever solved before. So you have to think about it. What are my solutions for that problem? How can we do that so that it fits for us? And though you have to define your own practices. Yeah, and we started at the monolithic architecture. Where did we came out? We came out at a microservice-based architecture, cloud native. What are the advantages? Have you ever heard of cloud native? <laughs> yes, it okay. sounds nice. Just another buzzword. <laughs> uh, so what are the advantages from a microservice-based architecture? architecture? You have loosely coupled services, which just means less dependencies. You have uh, improved fault isolation. For example, if you hit a memory leak or something like that, you know it, one memory leak in a monolithic architecture can bring down your whole application. If you have a lots of microservices, one memory leak will only hit one microservice. So all the other services are still up and running, though your application is still up and running. You have a continuous integration, continuous delivery, DevOps workflow, we talked just about that. You have great testability because your, your test patterns, you don't have to write it for the whole application. You just write short test patterns for the microservice so the tests are more accurate and you can write your tests more fast. You have excellent scalability and you have just a high grade of automation. You have a significantly increased quality and yeah, you have short release cycles. Just to give you a quick overview, how can that look in real life? Uh, you have your UI, your app, your front-end services, and in the back, um, back-end service, you have lots of microservices. And the special is um, all microservices are talking to each other, but no service is dependent from the other one. Though so just one service can go down, and all others are still running, are still surfing requests. Yeah, that sounds... Super easy. Yeah. So start right now. Um, in real life, you have like really, really, really many chances, chances when you go to uh, Kubernetes, but you also have many risks. So uh, some, just some advices we can give you. Start very early, not too late. Make a good plan. And the third point is ask us. We will help you. So yeah, that's basically it. Um, we would love to talk to you about the trending technologies on our booth. There you can see some of uh, our software we're using right now, our tool chain. And yeah, step by our booth at uh, F04, I guess. And uh, yeah, and we can, can talk about how we can manage to bring you in on uh, Kubernetes and help you with that. So thank you very much. Step by our, at our booth at Four o'clock, we have like a, a beer party there, and then we can have like a, a talk. Thank you very much. Pew, Pew, oh, have oh, you one of those is. nice shirts, maybe? Just one more thing. <laughs> we, have, we have a t-shirt for you. A t-shirt, so, yeah. Do we have a question, maybe? Oh, no. Question, question? Yeah. Only, only who, question? Who, who didn't like it? OK. Oh, there's two hands. It doesn't count. Okay. But, but we need a question.
question after that. So take care. <laughs> Woo! Woo! <laughs> hey, come to our booth. We'll give you a shirt right now. Okay? Thank you very much. Thanks. Thank you so much. Thank you, Marco. Thank you, Killian. Run for 8S. Right? Thanks. Thanks. Thank Thank you, gentlemen. Thank you both. Great presentation. And I love the little bit of drama at the end with firing t shirts into the audience. What will <laughs> they think of next? Okay. Can we go now? <laughs> you go. Thank you bye bye. Thanks. Great bye. presentation. Uh, one thing you could tell us, though, Marco, where do they find you to continue the conversation? Where is your booth address outside? At five, uh, uh, F04. 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 Yes. F04 to continue the conversation. Come to our booth. And with Marco. Bye bye.